Hi, my name is Sophia and I'm going to be one of your Swartwood guys. Where are you guys? We're part of the Swartwood family. And are you guys real MCAT DAT students? Yes. Yes. So hi guys, unlike the reviews where we can reteach everything from scratch, since we don't have that much time in this demo, what I'm going to do is answer a few questions that some people sent in. Okay? The first of which was a problem like this. So this is a setup for the first problem someone sent in. They basically had a rope attached to the mass, then a second rope attached to the second mass, obviously. Uh, the radius here was R1. The length from here to here was R2. Moving in uniform circular motion with the frequency of F. And all of this is given to you. And then the question was, can you tell me what the tension is in these two ropes? So we'll call this tension 2, and we'll call this tension 1. Okay? Based on these constants that are given to you. Okay, so not too bad, but let's give this a try. So the first setup is, you know if it's moving in uniform circular motion. So with that, you know centripetal force is mv squared over r, right? So remember when you're doing this problem that this is a requirement, okay? So what I mean by that is, if you have this mass and this velocity at this radius, right, and you want to keep moving in the circle, this is the force you have to give me to stay in that circle. Okay? People get confused. They think that that means that if you're just moving around in a circle, that magically generates a force. That never happens. Okay? This is a requirement. So to stay in the circle, you have to pay me this amount. But some other physical force has to give that to you. Okay? So maybe the easiest thing to look at is this guy. Okay? This guy up here. By the way, in this problem, we're not worried about gravity. We can imagine that this is on some smooth table like this. So there's no friction, and we don't have to worry about gravity pushing this guy down. Okay? So the idea is, for this guy moving this circle, the only force really acting on him is the tension pulling him in this way. Do you guys agree? So in this case, since there's a requirement to keep him in the circle, and the only guy that can give you that requirement is the tension, it's got to be true that this tension is equal to this required centripetal force. Do you guys agree? In fact, it's providing the required centripetal force. But you know that's m2, because that mass, right? v2 squared. We'll call it velocity 2 squared, right? Over the radius. And the entire radius here is going to be R2. Okay. So no big deal. Okay? The only thing is in a problem like this, the prof said that it was legal to use these as constants, mass 1, mass 2, and these as constants, radius 1 and radius 2, but, and also the frequency, but nothing else. Okay? So this is pretty much the answer. The problem is mass is legal, radius is legal, but the velocity is not legal. Velocity is the guy we have to take care of, right? But let me be a little bit more precise, because actually what we're looking for isn't really the velocity, it's the speed. The reason why is this guy here is a formula for the magnitude. The direction is always inward, but this formula I'm using here is computing the magnitude, right? So really when I see that v there, it doesn't really represent the velocity, because remember, velocity is going to have a size and a direction. In this equation, it's literally just the magnitude. How fast are you moving? Okay? And if you think of it that way, when you think of how fast you're moving, you know what that is, right? That's the distance you covered divided by the time. Okay? No big deal. And you know the distance you've covered, if you've got a radius of, say, R2, so if you had a radius of R2, and you go all the way around like this in one loop, right? Then the total distance you've covered, the circumference, right, is 2 pi R. Okay, no big deal. In this case, 2 pi R2. So let's put that in there. So velocity 2 should be 2 pi R2. No big deal. Then I need to divide by the time, right? You guys remember, the total time it takes to do one full cycle is a period, right? So in this case, I need to use one more relationship. The other basic relationship, so we have centripetal force, right? We also have that the period, the time it takes to go around and do one cycle, right? That's equal to 1 over the frequency. Okay? I'll talk about this in the review, but for the moment, we'll just take that as a given. Okay, so if that's true, remember, frequency is legal to use. Then we know that this guy... It's this guy divided by the period, but we know that that's also 2 pi r squared over 1 over the frequency, right? And just a little bit of arithmetic, that's 2 pi r2 times the frequency. Because you're dividing by 1 over the frequency, so you're just multiplying by the frequency. Okay, no big deal. Then to finish this guy, so let me just take this away. All we're going to do is just plug in. So now, the tension in that guy has got to be mass 2. Velocity 2 squared, but this is velocity 2. So I'm going to, so 2 pi r2 frequency squared over the radius, which is r2. Do a little bit of arithmetic and clean this up. Then I think this is going to be what? 4 pi squared m2 r2 frequency squared, where I had both this guy cancel out one of the guys over here. Okay. So 
Not too bad, right? Okay. So if you're comfortable with that, we're going to catalog this. I'm going to use it to solve the second part. The second part is, what's the tension in here? Okay. So I've cleared up some room. I catalog what we did before. Now let's go for the second part. So the second part is, what's this tension over here in this rope, right? Okay. Um, one thing I want to kind of do is some pieces. We're using the same idea. This guy is basically going around in a circle, more or less, right? So you know there's a required centripetal force to keep him in that circle. Okay, so let's go with that. So there's a required centripetal force that's going to be something like its mass times its velocity squared over its radius. Okay, no big deal. Okay. Remember, the same problem as last time. These guys are legal. This guy is not. I have to get rid of them. Okay. So let's work on this. So then if we did this, we know it's its mass over its radius. Now you're working on that velocity. This is exactly what we did just a little while ago, right? So you know, to get the velocity, I keep saying velocity, but what I really mean is speed, right? Okay, so now, we're going to figure this out. We did this before, so we know that the speed here, in this case, is going to be what? It's going to be the distance we've covered, which is 2 pi r, I guess 1 this time, right? Divided by the time it took us, which we knew is, know is a period. We already figured out from last time, the period, though, is oops, 1 over the frequency, right? That was another given. We solve for this, remember if you're dividing by a fraction, you multiply by its reciprocal. So we'll end up getting something that looks like this, 2 pi r1 f. Okay, that's not too bad. We come back over here, just like before, 2 pi r1 f, that substitutes for v1, and we're going to square it. Okay, almost done, but actually there's a little bit more work, even once we're done with this. Let's finish this. This is m1, two, well, let's do it all out this time, 4 pi squared R1 squared, F squared. Sorry, it's getting a little sloppy. Let me choose this thing. Okay? Over R1. Okay? And then what we'll do is we'll kill the R1 top and bottom. No big deal. Okay, looks really similar to this. In fact, we could have skipped these steps because you know it's going to follow the same pattern. We're just going to replace it by M1 and then R1. So no big deal there. Okay, but this isn't the end of the story. Because what's happening here is this time, it's not just the tension providing this. Remember, there must be a net force. So what this guy says is, this is the required net force pulling this guy in. Do you guys agree? So I cleared a little bit of room, so let's think about this for a sec. So this situation is a little bit more complicated. But to give us some intuition, think about this. When this guy was going around in a circle, right, the options were either the tension to was strong enough to keep him in. If it wasn't, what would happen? He would pull on the rope. The rope wouldn't be strong enough, the rope would break, and this guy would fly off. Do you guys agree? Okay. So the only thing keeping him in this circle is the tension of the rope pulling him in. So to give you some intuition for this, it's like this guy wants to fly off, so he tugs on the rope. The rope doesn't want to break, so the rope pulls back, right? So think of tension and rope kind of like a spring. So what's happening is this guy pulls like this, so what's the spring want to do? It wants to pull back like this. Do you guys agree? So on this end, it's pulling in, but on this end, it's pulling this way. Right? Because it's like taking a spring, stretching it like this, and now it's going to pull back at both ends. Okay. So, just so we have some rough intuition, that kind of tells us the tension here on this end is going to pull out this way. So now what's happening is tension 2 is not working for you, it's working against you, right? You need the net force to be directed inward, you need that to be the required centripetal. But now you've got two players in the game. So, I need my required centripetal to equal, well, it comes from who? It comes from two players, right? It comes from T1 helping you out, because it's pulling you in like it should. But it's also come, it also comes from T2 pulling away from you, so it's actually hurting you. So this guy's working against you. Do you guys agree with this? Okay. So remember, the idea is this is just a requirement. Somebody's got to give you the requirement. T1 helps you out. T2 hurts you. So you've got to have T1 beat T2 to give you the requirement. Okay. So if we actually solve for T1, what's going to happen is... T1 has got to give you the requirement, plus he's got to make up for T2 working against you. So we're just doing a little bit of math, right? We solve and get this guy. Okay, so no big deal. So now if we're solving for T1, it's going to be first T2, which we already solved for. 4 pi squared, m2, r2, f2 squared. Or sorry, f squared. Then on top of that, it's going to be what? Plus the square to triple that we need, which is... 4 pi squared, m1, r1, f squared. Both of these guys put together. Do you guys agree? Okay. So now all we do is just factor it out to make it pretty. So t1 is, we can factor out that 4 pi squared. We can also factor out that f squared. So all we're doing now is factoring this out. 
right? And then what we have left over is M2 R2 plus M1 R1. Not that bad, right? Okay, but remember the key ideas. The key ideas in this problem were something. So let's do a quick recap conceptually of this problem. So first we had this setup here, and we wanted to compute what was going on this guy. And we knew the tension was working for us, right? So we know there's a required centripetal to keep you going the way you want, or in the circle in this case, right? That required centripetal is provided by T2 to so your done. Because somebody has to give you that requirement, T2 is the only one that can do it, okay? The second part of the problem was a little tougher, because then we had a mass one over here, right? It's still true. There's a requirement, some net centripetal we need in this way, right? And somebody has to provide it for you. But in this case, there are two players. First, there's T2. I don't think it's that hard for people to believe that T1 is actually going to pull in the direction you want. So you know the required centripetal will be given by T1, right? But look at T2. In this case, T2 actually works against you. So you need a net pull this way. T1 goes this way, but T2 goes the opposite way. So T2 works against you, right? After we had this set up, we just did a little math and solve for T1. And then we got that T1 had to be this guy plus this guy. Okay. Not too bad. The only other thing that sometimes confuses people is on this thing. How do you know which way tension is going? Remember, tension technically at every point is going both directions. But the easiest way to think of it maybe is think of it like a spring. So remember, this mass wants to fly off, so he pulls on the rope. So you take this rope and you stretch it like a spring, so you know the spring's going to pull back this way. So on this end it pulls to the left, on this end it pulls to the right. Okay. If you want to do it slightly more formally, you can think of it like at every little point on the rope, you're stretching it so the tension's pulling back in both directions, right? So in a way, the tension's canceling out at every point, right? Or the net force at every point is going to be zilch, right? Except when you get to the end, because you can see on this end, the only direction you can pull is to the right. And on this end, the only way you can pull this is to the left. Because the rope doesn't exist, there's an object here. And the rope doesn't exist on the left-hand side, there's an object here. So if you haven't seen this in class, don't worry about it. During the review, we'll spend plenty of time like, talking about this until everyone feels comfortable. But if you guys have any questions, please let me know. See you next time. Hi, my name is Stephanie. If you have any questions, just email me. Bye.